Well, it's good to have you. Hey, <laughs> free clapping lessons afterwards. That was great. We do need it. I, uh, I was thinking, man, we're really bad at this. But you asked a bunch of Baptists to clap, so what do you, what do you expect from us? Luke 18 tonight. Luke 18 is our passage. If you'll turn there, we'll get there eventually. Luke 18. Um, as I said in my intro, maybe some of you weren't here. Let me just kind of re, retell that. We're starting a series called Accidental Pharisees tonight, so it should be really fun. Um, when you hear... When you hear someone call you a Pharisee, or it usually works out this way, you've heard someone has called you a Pharisee, right, because they rarely do it to your face. Um, If you hear someone has called you a Pharisee, what is the feeling that wells up inside of you? Is it happiness or a negative emotion? It's a negative emotion. Unless you've been under a rock for the past 2,000 years, if you're being called a Pharisee, you need to get something right. You need to change what you're doing. It's not a good thing to be called nowadays. It means you're uh, most likely a hypocrite and self-righteous and you look down on other people who aren't as spiritual as you are, who aren't up to speed with you and God, right? You and God are in cahoots, right, with heavenly things, but they are not, and so you're looking down at them. That's what it means to be called a Pharisee. But here's what I want to tell you tonight, and this, this is an interesting thing. It wasn't always a bad thing to be known as a Pharisee. In fact, in Jesus' time, let me just, let me just uh, read Scripture here for you. Matthew 5.20. You don't have to go there. We'll have it on the screen for you. Um, Jesus said this. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me explain what's going on here. This is the middle, in the middle, kind of towards the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is not Jesus expounding on how easy it's going to be to earn salvation. That's not the case. He's actually laying out something that's way more difficult than the Old Testament law. He's saying, listen, you've heard it said that you should not commit murder, but I tell you, if you even hate someone in your heart, then you've already committed murder. That sounds a little more difficult than just not killing someone, right? How many people have hated someone? Don't lie. Today, right? Yeah, right. Everyone's hated someone today, man. Um... Jesus is not saying, this is the bar way down here that the scribes and Pharisees have set as far as righteousness goes. It's, you got to get over that to get in the kingdom of heaven. His point is to to show us it's really hard to earn the righteousness or to earn the favor of God and salvation. It's actually impossible, and that's what he was trying to tell them. Unless your righteousness um, supersedes or is better than, greater than, the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So back then, people didn't say, well, yeah, of course, a bunch of hypocrites. I mean, I could do better than that. No, when the people heard this, so Jesus was talking to the disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, but then there's people around just kind of listening in. Everyone around was like, okay, well, we, then we can't be saved. Are you kidding me? How am I going to be more righteous than the Pharisee? That guy, that's all he does. He never leaves the church. How am I supposed to do that? So it wasn't always a bad thing. They're thinking, man, I, there's no way I could be as good as that Pharisee is. Now, Paul does the same thing in Philippians 3, verse 5. Listen to this. He's, this is, um, and before I read it, and don't look at the screen yet, okay? This is Paul kind of giving his credentials, his Christian credentials. So check this out. He says, circumcised on the eighth day. In case you don't know Jewish history, that's the best day to be circumcised, okay? Okay. Um, Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. So what he means by that is, as to the law, uh, I was really good at it. I was blameless as to the law. You're not going to find anything wrong with me as to the law. I'm a Pharisee according to the law. I go to church all the time. I'm at church more than anyone. I'm at the synagogue more than anyone. I pray more than anyone. I fast more than anyone. I'm a Pharisee as to the law. You cannot find anything wrong with me. He wasn't saying, I'm not really great. The whole point of Philippians 3 is Paul showing us how incredible, really, of a religious person he was. And then he says, all that is nothing compared to knowing Christ Jesus. So, it wasn't always a bad thing to be called a Pharisee. It all changed when Jesus showed up on the scene. And then he starts... Um, really picking fights, just subtle fights with these guys, and he's showing you don't have it all right. 
You have forgotten that a heart of love must accompany your good deeds if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came and started setting everything on its head. So, here's the reason we start this way. Um, Unless we understand this day and age of what it was to be a Pharisee, then we won't understand any time when Jesus attacks the Pharisees. You see, because for so long I've read the, the gospel accounts and Jesus kind of picking those fights with the Pharisees. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, they're just a bunch of hypocrites, of course. But here's the deal. Jesus came and everyone around him thought the Pharisees for sure are going to go. They're going to heaven. We just got to figure out if I can go. But Jesus came and said, you guys aren't going to the Pharisees. The people who've got it all figured out, have got all the answers, who are the leading scribes, the leading teachers, y'all aren't going. I didn't say that. There's no verse that says you guys aren't going. (laughs) But from the way he talked about them, he called them children of the devil. He called them whitewashed tombs. He called them evil. He wanted to grow his church, you see. Some of you get that. Okay. He did those things. Listen. Listen. They were stunned to the core to hear that they were a child of the devil. To hear that they were whitewashed tombs, which means that, kind of like Adam wrote in the song, outside we're well-dressed, but the stains on the inside, man, they're filthy. They're decaying from the inside. Catholics look very pretty, but on the inside, it's not life, it's death. They were stunned to the core. Like, wait a second. We're the ones going. We're the ones going to heaven. Now, they were probably stunned in the same way that most of us are going to be tonight. Because here's what i got to say. I've been here four and a half years. I know a lot of you people. Y'all ain't perfect. And, and I know you retort, well, we've known you for four and a half years and you're not perfect. I gladly concede that. Right? I'm not. Most of us in here are Pharisees. Are you stunned? You're a Pharisee. You're probably not one that um, is going to wind up in hell like most of those that Jesus had a talking to, unless outside of Scripture, you know, some, you know, they accepted him as Lord and Savior. You're probably not that. You're not going to, I mean, you're a believer, but a lot of your actions are probably pharisaical. And the title tonight is actually from a book by Larry Osborne. I don't really recommend you reading it because it will blow you up. Um, But it's, it's titled Accidental Pharisees. I read it a few months ago. I said, man, we need to talk about this. Because I don't believe Crestview is full of Pharisees on purpose, right? I believe we got a lot of accidental ones. What that means is we didn't wake up and set out to be a Pharisee, but we wound up being one anyways. And here's the deal. It doesn't matter how you became one, you're still one. Right? So we didn't set out to become Pharisees, but most of us have wound up that way. We're going to get into, okay, uh, what that means and, and how we can... Right the ship, I guess you could say, but our journey, here's the deal. Our journey often starts out on this road to accidental Phariseeism, being an accidental Pharisee. Our journey starts out in the most genuine way possible. Tell me if you've ever seen this happen. Tell me if this has ever been your story. You read a book. You read a book. The guys are like, okay, I gotta have another story. I didn't read a book, okay? Um, guys, read books, please, okay? Um, uh, where was I going? Okay, so you read a book, or you went to a program, or you learned some new doctrine, or you went on a mission trip, and you came out of reading that book, or you came out of the mission trip, or you came out of the program, whatever it is, maybe Breaking Free starting next week, shameless plug, okay? Um, Maybe you came out of that, and you were on fire for whatever it was, this book, that mission trip, this doctrine, that program. You came out on fire, and that's all you wanted to talk about, right? Anyone ever been there? Okay, good. Now, of those of you who have been there, and all the rest of you have been there, you just don't remember, okay? How many of us, how many of us soon, very soon afterwards, realized, man, not everyone read that book. I I guess you've never been through the program. Or you apparently don't know this doctrine. Or you weren't on the mission trip. Listen, I grew up in Brazil, and then for... About 10 years afterwards, I would go back on mission trips. And the first few, I was still in high school, and I'd come back, and I would be wanting to tell my dad all sorts of stuff about the trip. And he just didn't seem that excited about it. I thought, man, are you a pagan, Dad? 
But then I realized, Dad didn't go on the trip. Dad has no idea. And I actually teach this in Missions 101. To temper your excitement when you come back, not because we're killjoys here, but because we don't want you to be devastated when people don't give a rip about your trip to Myanmar. It's not that they don't love Jesus. They weren't there. We start out very honestly, very genuinely. It's good to be on fire for God. You've got this renewed zeal and passion. You want to share this book. You want to share this new doctrine that you found. You want everyone to go through this program. And so you're sharing it, man, more than anything else. But then you're realizing that people just aren't down with it. It's not that they hate Jesus. They're just, you know, they got other things going on. And here, here is where the road takes a turn for many of us, and many of us have chosen poorly. We come to a fork in the road. We've got two options. Many of us choose poorly. We can either choose to love that person despite our differences, despite the fact that we think that they're not as strong as a believer as us, or we start to look down on them. We start to look down on them and just kind of, man, it's a shame. It's just a shame. And we don't say this, right? But in our hearts, man, it's just a shame that you don't believe what I do. It's just a shame that you, you're not loving enough to go to a foreign country and share Jesus. You'd rather sit and watch television. That's just a shame. Start judging people. Start judging people. Listen, if you don't think this is easy to do, just think about why you believe the things you believe. You believe them because they're right. Anyone out there knowingly, actively believing something they know is wrong? No, you're not. You believe what you believe because you think it's right. Every day you're going to come up against people who don't believe that stuff. Man, you got an opportunity to be an accidental Pharisee every day. Point being, this is a serious thing we got to talk about. Accidental Pharisee. So we start out genuine. It's a good thing to go on a mission trip, good thing to read a book, program, uh, new doctrine, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not good to start looking down on people because they're not up to speed with you and God. Let me show you this perfectly from uh, the Scripture Look at Luke 18. I told you to turn there at the beginning. Luke 18, we're going to go verse 9 through 14. The error here, listen, the error is not in being on fire for God. The error is in judging others because they're not. Follow me? Okay. So let us, let us uh, read 9 through 14 here. We'll walk through it. Jesus it says this, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. This is a very rare sighting of Jesus actually explaining why he told a parable, or Luke explaining why Jesus told this parable. He told it because some people were trusting in themselves that they were righteous, and they treated others with contempt. Look at verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this, like this t- tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, here's, here's what we got to note. This is actually the first sermon I preached. I came in view of a call in, in August of 2009. I preached a sermon. It's probably a dumb choice, but anyways. Um, uh, here's what we've got to realize. Pretty much everything the Pharisee says isn't bad. It's pretty much all good. He says, okay, let's just take a poll. Who agrees in here that it's, it's a good thing to not be an extortionist or unjust or an adulterer? Right? We all pretty much, okay, that's good. Pharisee's not that. That's good. And then he says, and then I fast twice a week, and I tithe in all that I get. Man, this guy tithes before taxes. Some of you get it. Man, this guy's legit. Is this not who we hire? I mean, given the, given the choice between an extortioner, unjust adulterer, and someone who's not, that actually fasts twice a week, something that's really hard to do, and he tithes of all that he gets, do we not hire this guy over another one? Should not God want this guy on his team rather than the tax collector who's actively been taking money from his own people to give to a government that's oppressing them? And yet, what does Jesus say? The second guy, the tax collector, is the one that goes home justified, not the first one. 
not the first one. See, because there's one little thing that the, that the Pharisee just can't, can't hold within. He, he's got to say it, and this betrays his heart. I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. He started out with zeal. He's a zealous person who doesn't want to give in to the world. I don't want to be an extortioner. I don't want to be unjust. I do not want to be an adulterer. I do want to follow the commands of tithing and the command to, to fast. I do want to do those things. That's zealous. That's good. That's a passion for God. That's right living. That's a call to holiness. That's what we should want. But the minute he starts looking down on someone else, because he is not all those things, you're out, dude. So Jesus said, you're out. You continue like this, you will not make it. And the guy that you are looking down on, guess what? He's in. He's in. Because it is humility. It takes humility to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. People who don't think they need a Savior are not humble, so they do not need Jesus. See, this man, Jesus told us why he told the parable. He trusted in himself that he was righteous, and he treated others with contempt. I thank you that I am not like this tax collector. See, here, here let, me, let me just put it in, in modern day terms. So you might, you might wake up at 5 a.m. every day and you read Oswald Chambers, right? You read My Utmost for His Highest and you pray for an hour. That's great. But you can't start looking down on those of us who didn't know the clock had two fives. I didn't know that. I guarantee all these youth up here don't know that. There's two fives. P.M. A.M. It's great. We want our people to put God first every single day, but we don't want our people looking down on people who are having a tough time doing it. It's hard to do. I think that I'm not like this tax collector. We don't want to have that attitude. There's so many ways that we do these things. There's so many sorts of things. I was talking with some people at the guest table earlier today, and we actually, this actually came up. It was crazy. Um, that, that stage that we're in, remember when you learn the new book, or you've been through the program, you went on the mission trip, or you uh, learn a new doctrine or whatever? We call this the cage stage, which means that you'd be better off in a cage than out there just beating everyone over the head with whatever new knowledge you've gained. The, this, this term, and it could have been used for something else, but mainly it's used today for young people who come to a knowledge of what, what they call Reformed theology. Um, and so they learn this, and they love it. It's, it's basically the sovereignty of God and salvation. They learn this, and then you cannot shut them up. And most people grow out of the stage, or cage stage. Thank the Lord I did. I hope I did. If you're a friend of mine, please tell me if I haven't. Okay? Be a true friend. But, uh... Yeah, it's a cage stage, man. How about you go sit in the cage, chill out for a bit, and then you can come back out into the public and stop beating everyone over the head with whatever you learned. All right? We do this with all sorts of things. Um, in this book, in this book, Accidental Pharisees, which once again, read at your own peril, um, Larry Osborne kind of states some, some Christians that we've got going in the church today. Tell me if you've ever heard of any of these. Let me tell you something. I'm guilty of all four of them. At one point or another. Not proud of that. But check this out. You got radical Christians. Radical Christians tend to see generosity as the leading indicator of what it means to follow Jesus. The required metric is a generous and simple lifestyle with the caveat that if you don't live simply enough, you aren't generous enough. So here, don't drive a BMW, basically. Crazy Christians. These are the people who see themselves as crazy in love with Jesus. Their litmus test of a true disciple is costly personal sacrifices, financial or otherwise. Evidence that you've been persecuted for your faith is highly valued. So are a few wild leaps of faith that all of your friends thought were nutso. Missional Christians. This is popular with people my age. They want to know what you're doing to fulfill the mission of God. If you start up a soup kitchen, volunteer to tutor at-risk kids, or move your family from the suburbs to the inner city, you'll have no problem earning the badge. Gospel-centered Christians. They like to determine spiritual maturity by means of their theological grid. If you like big words, careful distinctions, and nuanced debates, you'll fit right in. It also helps if you've read something by Jonathan Edwards recently. 
To pass this litmus test, you'll want to use lots of Bible verses. Avoid the word pragmatic and tie everything to the gospel. To be certified as spiritually mature, you'll need a robust theology. Of course, that usually demands a robust intellect and a decent education. So if you're slow on the uptake, dyslexic, action-oriented, better with your hands than your mind, or have a hard time with big words and long paragraphs, you'll be allowed to attend, but don't expect to lead anything. Ouch. If that felt biting, it's because it was meant to. It bit me right in the rear end. Today it's popular to be missional or to to be gospel-centered, but um, if you have a spirit of being an accidental Pharisee, then you'll start to look down on people that, as Osborne puts it, didn't know there was a new buzzword to conform to. Man. I got... We got people who maybe are just working the nine to five, right? Or the eight to seven. I have no idea. Working with their hands and they don't, they don't have time to read books. And they're just trying to make ends meet for their wife and their three kids. And they don't know, they have no idea what it means to be mission or gospel centered. And so often, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that guy. Who doesn't even know the buzzword that he's supposed to be conforming to. Hmm. That's tough. That's tough. So once again, here's the deal. It's not just Jesus was this way. And hopefully we get an understanding of what it really meant to be a Pharisee back then. Like it was a good thing. And so Jesus came and he just, everyone, most everyone you thought was going to be in, it wasn't in. And, and most of the people they thought were going to be out, like I'm out for sure, they were in. And so Don't go to the Gospels if you've been constructing your perfect little world and you're building your own little kingdom and you've surrounded people or yourself with people who agree with you. You've created uniformity and not unity. There's a difference. Don't go to the Gospels because if you really read them and you get what they mean, Jesus mess you up. You see, Luke 15, Jesus told the story, first a couple of parables about the lost sheep and then the lady with the lost coin and then the lost or the the prodigal son. And the key to understanding everything is Luke 15, 1. When he says, in the crowd were tax collectors and Pharisees. So Jesus is like, all right, here we go. I got a couple of, three stories here that will impact this group of people. And what he proceeds to say is that the shepherd who's watching nine, or has a hundred sheep and one gets away, he's going to leave the 99 and he's going to go find the one because it's not the 99 righteous that need cleansing. It's, it's the one. He needs to be found. He tells about the lady with the lost coin, but then he moves on to the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, he's demanding and he's selfish and he's worldly and he wants his inheritance now and he gets it and he takes it and he blows it and he's living in squalor, eating with pigs and he comes home and the dad is super excited to see him. He actually meets him halfway out in the pasture or whatever and he says, you know what? My son was gone and now he's back. Let's throw a huge feast. And so every, all, man, all the, tar, all the tax collectors and the sinners and all the, the, the people of the night, basically, are, are standing there listening to the story like, man, alive. This sounds really good. Because that's me. But then Jesus throws a twist in there for the Pharisees and he says, and there's the older brother and he was not happy. He was not happy that the younger brother came home and the dad was so pumped and he killed a fatted calf for him and they threw a party he said he returned home from working and he could hear music and dancing we've we've said this before if you hear dancing that's a party man right (laughs) he didn't hear just music he heard music and dancing they are dancing i know we're baptists but anyways um he comes home and he's upset that this has all happened and he, he just grows indignant and he will not go in. And he tells his dad, all the, he, he, you know, my brother, he went and squandered everything and then I've, I've done nothing but serve you and I've been here and you wouldn't even give me a goat. Listen, I cannot find a more pristine picture of a cold-hearted legalist Pharisee in the Bible than someone who says, I've been serving you all this time, you haven't even given me a goat. You want a goat? We're going to eat like filet in here and you want a goat? 
Maybe I'm just confused because I'm a city boy, but what are you going to do with a goat when we got this fatted calf in here? But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Jesus, or God, the, the father figure in the story. See, because this is, that's my heart. You want a goat, dude? Fine. Here, have a goat. Whatever. That's my heart. But that's not right. That's not, that's not right of me. I have no grace in that moment. But that's not how the father in the story goes. He goes out to the older son and he entreats him. Come in. Come on. See, God has patience for the Pharisee as well. That's crazy. Because I don't. But God does. Thankfully, he is in charge. I want to end with a story of one guy that, that has challenged me um, recently um, from the Bible. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. He's the man um, that came forward to ask for Jesus' body that he might give him a, a proper burial, right? Because petty thieves and criminals, as Jesus died with the two other guys, they don't get a proper burial. And so um, Joseph is the guy who comes forward to, to ask for Jesus' body. It was a bold, bold move there. He's mentioned in all four gospel accounts, and this is really interesting. I, want, I really want you to pay attention here. Matthew 11 tells us that he was rich. So we have a rich guy, okay? So, so much for him being radical or crazy in love with Jesus because apparently you can't be rich. But this guy was. That's Matthew 11. We don't have time to read all the verses, but you can go back and check it. Matthew 11 tells us, Matthew tells us he was rich. We have a rich disciple. Mark, in chapter 15 of his book, tells us that Joseph is a part of the council or the Sanhedrin. This is the group that turned Jesus over to Pilate to be murdered. So we've got a rich, political, powerful guy now. All right? Rich, political, power guy who rubs shoulders with the guy who turned Jesus over to cru be crucified. And then Luke calls Joseph a good and righteous man. This is scripture. Okay? So we have to assume this is right. Luke 23. Luke calls Joseph a good and a righteous man. So we've got a rich guy who has a lot of political power, who is rubbing shoulders every day with the people who turned Jesus over, and he's good and righteous. Hmm. This is getting interesting. I have to think, if you are righteous, then why didn't you speak up and say something in the Sanhedrin? John tells us why. John, in John 19, tells us that Joseph was a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. So let me just summarize this for you. He is rich. He has political power. He was in the group. No doubt he did not vote to crucify Jesus, but he was there. He could have said something. And he's righteous, but he's also kind of a coward. He's a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. And Luke calls him good and righteous. Man, that messes with me. How do we treat someone like that nowadays? I'll tell you what goes up in my, in my mind, in my sinful, fallen nature. I see a rich political figure who apparently never shares his faith. One of the first verses I say is, well, you deny Jesus in front of men, he's going to deny you. Isn't that what we go to? Come on, man, pick, up, pick it up. You got all this money, you got all this power, do something for the kingdom. Jesus didn't do that. God didn't do that. You know what God did? God gave him a prominent role in the resurrection. Here, in case you didn't know, you can't rise from the dead unless you're buried. Joseph of Arimathea was the guy who got to take Jesus' body and wrap it and do all the spices stuff that they did back in the day and bury him. The rich, powerful political guy who's kind of scared but is also righteous played a huge role. You know who did not? You know who was not there to pick up Jesus' body? Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthew. None of them. None of them. Joseph of Arimathea was. So that gets my mind going. And, I, and then it makes me wonder, how far down this road of accidental Pharisee have I wandered? Because in, in the past few months, I feel like God's been working with me. Because here's the deal, in the church, and I don't even know if I said this last week or two weeks ago, I have no idea, but I'm going to say it again. There's a big, like, thin the herd mentality going on in the church nowadays. We have thin the herd. And there's a couple of, of scriptures, and I've preached them very strongly, where Jesus thins the herd. And we always go, we go to John 6, and that's where we go, because the chapter starts with 5,000 men. 
And there were women and children there. And Jesus feeds them all. And the chapter ends with 11. Judas has, has bailed at this point. It ends with 11. And so I always go to that. Thin the herd. Thin the herd. Thin the herd. Here's the deal, man. All the other instances, like I went through the Gospels and all the other instances, Jesus just has compassion on these people. They're showing up because they have a disease and they want to be healed. What do we say to that nowadays? Or you're coming for a felt need. You're coming because you want something from Jesus. Yeah, I want to be healed. I'm saying, man, he had compassion on all these people. And then, we, and then we get all over the people who are consumers. Heard a guy say this recently. How about next summer, we turn off the AC for three straight weeks. We'll see how many consumers we got. We'll see what attendance is like on that fourth Sunday when no announcement has gone out through constant contact or whatever that the AC has been fixed. You think that fourth Sunday is going to be highly attended? Absolutely not. I might even take vacation. <laughs> even the staff isn't here. You try that in the summer of 2011 when we had 80 straight days of 100 degree weather. <laughs> we'll see how many consumers we got. I'm just saying, man. I, here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we do everything we can to get people in here and we just want to grow our numbers. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, don't we got to get them here at some point? Don't we want them to hear the gospel? They're not going to hear it out there. They're not going to just watch it on TV. That's nowhere. I'm all for punching people right in the face with the gospel once they get here, but they got to be here. they got to be here. And so we started tweaking some stuff. We're giving out a book on Sunday mornings. You've seen me up here doing my little spiel, right? You're probably sick of me by now. We're trying things to reach people. Jesus tried to reach people. He see all these people coming with diseases, and he knows good and well most of them aren't going to stick with them. But he heals them anyways. He heals them anyways. Most of those people were kind of just what we call nowadays Basically just carnal Christians. Do you think that in in the Jewish world where, I mean, everything was religious, everything, that they hadn't heard about all this stuff, that you need to be a righteous person, a lot of these people aren't super pagans. They've grown up around the synagogue. They know. Aren't these the people that we condemn so often? I don't want to condemn them. Let me summarize for us. We've said a lot of things, and this is, this is some heated stuff, man, and, and, and we can hear all sorts of things because our flesh is evil, and when I'm learning all this stuff, I'm like, ah, you know, I get really mad at it or whatever. But let me just summarize here so you know exactly what God is telling us through his word tonight. It is not wrong to be on fire for God, and it is not right to sit on the sideline and do nothing for Jesus. Not wrong to be on fire, and it is not right to waste the God-given blessing that you have had to share gospel with others. It's not right to sit on the sidelines and not use that. However, to start looking down on people who are struggling with that, that has crossed a boundary that God has not allowed. So yeah, you might have a very robust, quiet time, but don't look down on your neighbor who struggles. And you might have been on 10 mission trips already, but don't look down on your friend who's scared because he doesn't know how he's going to pay the bills if he has to pay for a $3,000 mission trip. Here's how scripture puts it. It says, Jesus, he's not going to break a bruised reed. And he is not going to put out a smoldering wick, a, a candle that has grown, its light has grown faint. Because life's hard. But he's not going to put that out. Let me tell you something. You're going to live long enough to where you're going to be that bruised reed. And you are going to be that smoldering wick. And in that day, you are going to pray for the mercy of God and the grace of God to keep you, to keep you aflame. Should we not want the same for others? Be on fire for God. Have that zeal. Go on those mission trips. Read those books. Learn new doctrines. We just can't look down on people who aren't there with us. They'll get there. Let us repent of being Pharisees, even if we wound up there accidentally. Let's pray. Father, I just want to just repent here in front of everyone that I'm guilty of all of this and more. And for a long time, 
God, looking down on people who just aren't like me. They're just different. Forgive me for doing that. Forgive us as a, as a church where we have done that. And God, I know, I know that your spirit is so present here. You're not going to allow us to sell out, God, but help us think about how we can reach people more. Keep us in your grace. Forgive us where we have looked down. And, and Lord, what I genuinely find here at our church is not a church that looks down on outsiders. We don't look down on people who aren't believers. We have a strong sense by your grace that everyone needs grace, including us. But maybe we look down on other Christians who aren't like us. But your word said if, if they can't see us loving one another, how are they going to believe in Jesus? Help us be unified. Help us have true unity, which means a, a difference of opinions on a lot of things. That's the strongest bond. Help us to turn back on the road to being an accidental Pharisee. Help us turn back to your grace, your love, and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.